is Boss Week! And to kick off Boss Week, I have the privilege of chatting with one of the most powerful philanthropists in the entire world. Not only is she an advocate for women, but she's also a New York Times bestseller. Please welcome the incredible Melinda Gates! Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, so glad we could do this. There's so much stuff I want to talk to you about, but this is Boss Week, so I want to start from the beginning. Before you were a public figure and before it was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you were traveling the world and meeting women from all walks of life. What was your biggest takeaway meeting all of those women? You know, in just sitting with women, it would often be on a small mat, you know, outside their home, and we'd be having some tea together. And you start to realize, meeting all these women, how alike we are versus how different we are. And, you know, for them to have me in, in their homes and to hear about their children or their hopes and the dreams, it just really touched me how, how we want the same things for our families. We want our kids to grow up healthy and get an education and a great job. And um, they really just inspired me over so many years from these many conversations I had. It was, it's been incredible. It's, it's amazing you say that because I feel like the more you travel to the furthest parts of the globe, the more you realize we're all alike and we all have yeah. these common threads. Now, Melinda, well, this is the first time we're meeting, correct? We've done, we've like maybe our teams have emailed a little bit. I'm going to just conclude that we are friends here, if that's cool. That's the conclusion okay. I'm going to. We're friends and I want to have some real talk with you because I read your annual letter and I loved it, by the way. I read it and you talk a lot about women needing to be the center of the COVID response. And a lot of why you say this is because of unpaid care. Now, this is kind of parallel to what you're talking about with family planning. And the real top question I want to ask you is, you know, you are obviously a very wealthy white woman. And when you travel to places of the world where there's not only a financial issue, but a cultural issue, that's a barrier. How do you navigate that tricky space? Well, first of all, I often just go in as a woman from the West or an American woman, and I'm right. in a T-shirt, a pair of khaki pants. Sometimes I'll have one of my children with me. My 15-year-old daughter traveled with me um, at one point. And I just go in and say to the women that I want to learn. I want to learn about their lives. And I'm often working with a partner who's been on the ground and part of those communities for 20 or 30 years. And it takes a while, just like we're instant friends, of course, but you're not instant friends with these right. women. But they do warm up, particularly if, if you let the men kind of wander away at some point, then the women will roll up their sleeves and they'll literally get in this conspiratorial voice and say, you want to really hear what's going on? Now we can tell you. Also, that's common around the world. Wives being like, let me tell you the real gossip about my husband. <laughs> Right, and I can imagine that, you know, culture is different everywhere you travel. So it's not like what you will learn from Nigeria will apply to what you learn from Uttar Pradesh. Like, they have totally different cultures. And so I want to ask you, honestly, just a little selfishly, me being having an Indian background, what have you found helps tackle some of the cultural barriers in India when it comes to women? Yes, you often have to look, in, no matter what country you go into, you have to look at the power structures around a woman and what holds her back. And so often in India, particularly in Northern India, if you wanna teach women new practices that they might wanna take up, like understanding to breastfeed their baby early and immediately, keep the baby warm, you have to first influence the mother-in-law because she's oh. often has say or is in charge of her daughter-in-law. So you bring them together, these circles of older women and younger women, and you educate the older women. And then they'll say, oh yes, my daughter-in-law should do that instead of doing the traditional thing of maybe giving goat milk to the baby at the beginning. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that, but it's all the daughter-in-laws watching the show at home being like, yes, oh my God, my mother-in-law makes me do X, Y, Z. I love talking to you, Bestie. Like this is, I'm having such a good time right now. <laughs> uh, but I want to ask, you have such a strong voice and you're such a boss woman, but did it always start like that? Like you had to probably learn how to have a voice through this process of learning how to be in the public eye or were you always just very outspoken? No, no, I've definitely had to learn. And I and I would just say, you know, Look, I've gone, went into many situations early on where Bill and I would walk into a president or prime minister's office and, you know, the first person they would talk to is Bill and then they would continue to talk to Bill. And so I had to learn to speak up early and often. And then it was like this, you could almost see this light bulb go off. Quite often the prime minister or president was a man and then he'd be like, 
oh, she knows what she's talking about. She's deeply involved. And I had to coach Bill some to say, make space for me early on in these meetings, right? Oh, um, I like we're that. Assume you're the boss, but you're not. We are peers in this. And he he we wanted to be peers, co-chairs. And I love that you bring it up. And you also speak a lot about this in your book, The Moment of Lift, which is incredible. And I love that you said that you had to coach Bill a little bit to make space for you in these meetings because it takes two. You know, all of this progression takes two. And so what is it kind of like to coexist next to one of the most powerful men in the world? <laughs> well, I don't I don't see him at home as the most powerful man in the world. You tell him, you tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, at home, we do the dishes together and as a family. But yes, often at the office, he was seen as the more powerful one. So again, we would have conversations before we go into a meeting of, okay, make sure you give me space and time. I did learn every now and then I'd have to like kick him under the table. Like if he was over speaking me, like nobody likes to be, you know, <laughs> overspoken, a man or a woman. Now he much more readily makes space for me, which is great. And as it should be. I love that. And so you, you both talk a lot about gender equity around the globe, but how does that apply to in your household? Yeah, well, I had to look at that because, you know, one story I tell in my book is when our first daughter, Jen, was born, we both agreed about the school we eventually wanted her to go to, but it was not close to our house. And I finally said to Bill, we're making this decision about preschool that I could see all the years of driving ahead in the minivan. And I kept saying, why don't we wait and put her there at third or fourth grade? And he felt very strongly she started preschool. And I was so frustrated. And finally he said, why are you frustrated? And I said, I can see years ahead of driving. And he said, what if I drive several days a week? And this was a huge commitment for him. And interestingly, about three weeks into the school year, the moms kind of sidled up to me and they said, hey, have you seen a change in the classroom? And I said, well, I said, I kind of noticed more dads coming in in the morning. And they said, yeah, we went home and said to our husbands, hey, if Bill Gates can drive his daughter to school, so can you. And you so tell him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, by having this conversation in our own home, we inadvertently role modeled, and so more dads were driving to school. <laughs> I need to tattoo this interview on my forehead somehow because I love it so much. Oh my God, thank you so much for watching the show. If you click here, I think you can subscribe to the channel. If you click over here, more clips just like this one. Click them.